Hello guys, welcome back to PTED Chemistry channel. So my name is Mr. On, and in this tutorial video, I'll go through some qualitative analysis, uh, kind of experimentals. Uh, well, experiments, I guess, not experimentals. I've got a bunch of chemicals here behind me. Um, I was thinking like how best to actually um, categorize qualitative analysis of these chemicals. And the first thing that comes to mind is this thing called water of crystallization. All right. So water of crystallization are basically um, well H2O being water and they co-crystallize together with the compound itself. That's why you have the formula of the compound such as this. This is called sodium carbonate hydrated. When a compound is hydrated, it means that you have uh, water, H2O, as the core crystallizing solvent together within the giant ionic lattice of the solid. Okay, so they form crystals. Ooh. Okay, so a bit of white solid there. So sodium carbonate is a white solid. Sodium carbonate hydrated is also a white solid. If you look at the formula very carefully, so that thing there is dot H2O and it's got the molecular weight. Molecular weight refers to the molecular mass, MR, and it was given to two decimal places. What I've got here is an all level, uh, 14 to 16 years old all level, or IGCSE chemistry kind of the periodic table. So the periodic table itself just shows the relative atomic mass, uh, not on top but at the bottom, as the key indicates there. So what happened with the relative atomic mass in the all level or IGCSE standard is that they are not given to two decimal place or one decimal place, not that accurate. When you go to A levels, your periodic table will show you to one decimal place accuracy. And of course, in industry, they use two decimal place accuracy such as this. Okay, so give or take, if I have sodium carbonate, so that is Na plus CO3 2 minus. So as you know, the compound itself has no um, has no overall charge, so that means the LCM between one electron being lost from sodium and two electrons being obtained from CO3. If you do the LCM of one and two, the lowest common multiple, as I did it in primary school, is going to be two. So I'm going to need two of the Na plus and one of the CO3 two minus as such. Okay, so the formula of sodium carbonate is going to be Na two. CO3. So a lot of uh, teachers, a lot of books would have uh, taught you using the cross multiply method, which is essentially the manifestation of these uh, lowest common multiple method. So both methods are definitely okay as long as you understand the underlying principles uh, that govern well, where the numbers are coming from, why the formula is as such, because the objective is to get to an overall compound formula which has no overall charge. Na2CO3 is what you call sodium carbonate. Without the water of crystallization, Na2CO3 on its own is just called anhydrous. Anhydrous because no water of crystallization. Okay? So if you have no water of crystallization, you are anhydrous. If you have water of crystallization, you are called hydrated. Okay? So in this Tutorials. I'll go through a couple of these uh, hydrated compounds. So this is called hydrated sodium carbonate, and the formula is dot one H two O. So we say it has one water of crystallization. This is not a fixed number, and for different compounds, as I'll show you in a little bit, this can be a different number. But these are usually whole numbers uh, on its own. All right. So these are water that gets trapped within the giant ionic lattice when it crystallizes. As you know, crystallization is a method of purification and to get pure compounds, usually we purify them by crystallization. Okay. So to, to get the idea of these, because uh, there are some O-level IGCSE students who are just uh, beginning to learn about formulas, they are not aware what is the meaning of dot H2O. So if you know how to work out the relative molecular mass for sodium carbonate, Sodium carbonate means 2 times sodium, 1 times carbon, 3 times oxygen. That is what the formula actually means. Okay? So I'm getting tired of, uh, of actually holding the screen up, so I'm going to start screen recording on my iPad that I hope that I can um, 
do a picture in picture. So instead of holding my iPad up, I can just um, um, look at my iPad and you can see how I usually do my tutorials by looking at my iPad screen. Okay. So it's a screen recording on the iPad. I'm using an app called Notability. I'm writing on my iPad using an Apple Pencil, so it's a, it's a worthy investment for education. Uh, as you can see, all my tutorials have been done on this SAM hardware. I'm not doing advertising for Apple, it's just that uh, uh, any kind of uh, tablet where, which enables you to write or to do screen recording would have been okay. All right. So the fact that we have two sodium, go straight to the periodic table, two sodium, so there's two times 23. At least it is 23 on my very simple O level or IGCSE kind of predictable. And that is the molecular mass. 1 times carbon is 12. 3 times 16 is for the oxygen. I have to add up the individual masses because the molecular mass of sodium carbonate is not for me showing you on the screen again because I'll show you whatever is written down here on my iPad anyway. It's for the screen recording. So 2 times 23 plus 1 times 12, plus 3 times 16, I get 106, there's a whole number, but that is without the water crystallization, that is just the anhydrous without the water crystallization. Remember the hydrated is was dot H2O, so dot H2O means there is one water of crystallization, one water of crystallization, we could also be thinking about the mole, the mole ratio. For every one Na2CO3 unit, there is one H2O. I think I better show it just in case I don't get the chance to edit the video. So for every one Na2CO3, there is one H2O. Okay. So the mass of the Na2CO3 just now, which I calculated based on the working, was 106. And then what does the dot mean? The dot mean I have another, I have other molecules, it's called water crystallization. I have one of it, so I do one big square bracket, two times one for the two hydrogen, one times 16 for the one oxygen, so it's 106 plus one times 18, so there's one, two, four. As you could see, with one water crystallization, so sodium carbonate, Na2CO3, dot one H2O, the molecular mass as shown on the, the bottle itself, straight from the uh, factory, straight from the uh, chemical uh, producer, is 124.00. There's just higher level accuracy based on the operating table. I have just used a very basic, uh, well, a very elementary, uh, I'm thinking of the correct English word, a very primitive uh, periodic table in terms of uh, all level and IGCSE level accuracy to the nearest whole number. Okay, So I'm going to show you a little bit of other hydrated compound. This is magnesium sulfate. So Mg2 plus SO42 minus. So 2 plus and 2 minus the charge cancel. So 1 Mg2 plus 1 SO42 minus. The formula of magnesium sulfate is MgSO4. Here it say hepta. Hepta. When you, when you have done organic chemistry, you have heard of hepten, heptanol, hep Hep whatever, heptanol, heptine, whatever. H E P T, hep, okay, refers to 7. As you can see, MgSO4.7 H2O. I'm not sure how clear it is on the screen. You should be able to see it. MgSO4, that's the formula of magnesium sulfate, dot 7 H2O. So MgSO4 dot MgSO4.7 H2O. So on the screen itself, you can see that um, uh, it says the molecular weight, the molecular weight there, that's what it says there, not sure how clear it is, all right, but let's work out from my very simple predictable, it's going to be very close, even though it's not to one uh, decimal place, a two decimal place, so 7H2O, so the dot mean, I need to add 7 water of crystallization, so 7 times H2O molecule, Right, so there's MgSO4 that co-crystallized together with 7 H2O molecule. MgSO4, there is 1 magnesium, so 1 times the relative atomic mass of magnesium. If you are an A-level student watching this video, you should use your periodic table, which is the more accurate um, one decimal place relative atomic mass. And you know better than to use uh, this primitive one. So 1 times 32 needs to be added to the mass of the magnesium which was 1, and then 
one for sulfur and then I have four oxygen, so four times 16. Again, I have to do addition because I'm adding the total mass for the magnesium sulfate. Now I have seven water, so seven times bracket, one times two because two hydrogen, plus one times 16 because one oxygen. So as shown on the screen, you have to add in the mass that contribute, the gas contributed from the seven water of crystallization. Put that into the calculator. So 24 plus 1 times 32 plus 16 times 4, I get 121. That is the mass, the MR, the molecular mass, the molecular weight of NGSO4. You plus the molecular weight of 7 times 18, which is from the 7 H2O. So altogether 121 plus 126 is 247. This is how, what is the mass for 1 gram of it. As shown here, we have gotten one, we have gotten 247. As shown here is 246 point something because these were the more accurate relative atomic mass using the calculations. This is magnesium sulfate heptahydrate with 7 water of crystallization. And it is white in color, very crystalline. Okay. You can do a bit more exercise if you want to. I'm just going to very quickly show you zinc sulfate. So Zn2 plus SO4 2 minus. This is also 7 water. This is called heptahydrate. Is there a molecular weight given there? Yes, there is a relative molecular mass. It's around 2 at 7.5. You can use your periodic table and practice calculating the MR based on what I just shown you with magnesium just now. So work out the zinc. There's one zinc. Work out the sulfur. There's one sulfur. Work out the oxygen. There's 16 times 4. The dot 7 H2O means there are 7 water molecules of crystallization in the uh, giant ionic lattice. They call crystallize together to give you hydrated uh, compound, hydrated crystals. All right? 7 H2O, so you need to plus 7 times 18 because 18 is the molecular mass of 1 H2O molecule. This is a very old sample. It's supposed to be white color, but they are very crystalline. So when I dissolve it in water, they're supposed to give me a solution. I'm just going to show you a couple of other compounds, including transition metal species. Transition metals, uh, they form very special about them. They form colored compounds. If you get colored complexes, that contains metal cations. Colored complexes, that contains or colored compounds that contain metal cations, most likely it contains transition metal. Transition metal is that P is that region in the periodic table, you know, that's middle region. Those are the transition metal series. And copper, copper is Cu, it's just there. This is copper to sulfate, blue colored crystals. You might have done crystallization of these. This is uh, copper to sulfate. Pentahydrate, if you look carefully, copper to sulfate, they don't say it's hydrated, but if you look at the formula, CuSO4.5H2O. I think I'm just going to do the example here to show you again how to calculate the, the relative molecular mass. So we have copper to copper 2 plus because it's copper 2 sulfate. So one copper, so one times 64 plus 1 times 32 for the sulfur, plus 4 times 16 for the oxygen. And then the dot, the dot simply means in the giant ionic lattice of copper to sulfate, which is an ionic compound, cations, anion, copper 2 plus SO4 2 minus. I have 5 water crystallization. So 5 times, 5 times, 2 times 1 plus 16 times 1. Or you know the molecular mass of water because of two hydrogen and one oxygen atom is 18 or 18.0. So altogether I have these MR for the copper to sulfate plus the MR for the water times by how many water crystallization. 64 times 1 plus 32 times 1 plus 16 times 4. I get 160 and then I have 5 water crystallization. So 5 times 18, there's 90 and I get 250 to go well, to the nearest whole number. 
if you look at this, these are the more accurate molecular mass. Not sure how clear it is. 5H2O, the molecular weight is close to 250. I think it's 249 point something because they are using a more accurate um, relative atomic masses. Okay. Uh, there are many, many other compounds that are hydrated. So this is an example of copper 2 chloride. So copper 2 plus Cl minus. So it's CuCl2. This is dihydrate meaning it is CuCl2 because it's copper 2 plus Cl minus and it's dihydrate so it's dot 2 H2O like that. So there's the formula there. I'm not sure how clear it is on the screen though. I uh, don't know if it's autofocus but there's the molecular mass, molecular weight given there. You can practice your molecular mass calculations on these things. All right. Um, just want to show you very quickly, this is chromium 3 chloride, so Cr, Cl3, and it's a hydrate as well. It's a hexahydrate, so dot 6H2O, and the molecular weight is given there. So, of course, you don't need to know this molecular weight because you're given predictable, and you can work them out. It's not very clear. Perhaps I can use a spatula. To check it out so this is the color it looks it's not very clear here but it looks maybe I have a white background it looks a bit dark green okay so we'll do a bit of qualitative analysis on this in a little bit and hopefully it will make more sense okay so the idea in this tutorial I'm not doing actually actually I'm not doing the qualitative analysis for the test of cations in this video, if you're wondering. So this video, I focus on water crystallization because I'm going to do something that will show you the presence of the water crystallization in this compound. This is cobalt. Cobalt is CO, not CU. Cobalt is just next, well, two position. This is copper, CU. Nickel is here. Cobalt is here, CO. Um, this is cobalt 2 nitrate, so CO2 plus NO3 minus, and it's a hydrated compound. I think it's 6 hydrate, so it's dot 6H2O. So the formula is going to be CO2 plus NO3 minus, and you have two of them, so it's CO NO3 twice, and then dot, dot 6H2O, such as the formula here. Okay, and then the molecular mass is given there. If you are an O-level or IGCSE student, with your predict table, you can work out the molecular mass of the hydrated compound. I leave that as an exercise for you to do, and you should be able to get very close to this, to the nearest whole number. Okay, so a lot of it comes down to, there are some theory questions that actually ask you to, to work out the molecular mass or to do calculations on it therefore you need to know uh, what the dot actually means so then they can ask you something something dot 5h2o what does this mean it means one molecule or one one mole or one particular formula unit of that ionic compound how many water of crystallization is there water of crystallization is referring to the water molecule it's still water molecule that core crystallize with the ionic compound Core crystallize, cooperate. Cooperate means work together. Core crystallize means crystallize together with the ionic compound. Right? And of course, we also have cobalt chloride, CoCl2.6H2O. Uh, uh, the molecular weight, the molecular mass is given there. Cobalt, very colorful compounds again, transition metal compound. This looks a bit pinkish, not too sure it's very clear on the screen. Just now was cobalt. This is cobalt 2 chloride. Yeah, of course, yeah, no, it doesn't matter. This is nickel, nickel 2, nickel 2 chloride, so it's Ni2 plus Cl minus, and this one is 6 water as well, so NiCl2. Oh, not too sure it's clear or not. NiCl2 dot 6H2O. Okay, so so you can work out the molecular mass. NiCl2 dot 6H2O. The molecular weight is given there. Being a transition metal again, nickel is just in between cobalt and copper. Let me open this up and show you if I can open it. And yes, I can open it. 
It's a very old bottle, obviously. Uh, a lot of the times, these kind of chemicals, they are not really tested in all level. Beautiful green color. This was nickel uh, two chloride for six water crystallization. You can work out the molecular weight. Color compounds, transition metal form, very beautiful color compounds. Okay? These are all hydrated compounds. This is an example of, uh, what is this? This is nickel sulfate, so another nickel compound. Nickel, Ni2+, plus. it should be nickel 2 sulfate. Ni2+, plus SO4 to minus. It's a heptahydrate, it's a dot 7 h 20 It's got this much molecular weight, so you have to get the molecular mass of nickel. Okay, so if you forget how to do that, let me just show you the example. And this will be the last example of uh, uh, calculation of the molecular mass of this hydrated salt that I'll show you before I proceed to the actual uh, uh, qualitative analysis. Not of the cations, but of something that I want to show you that proves the presence of the water crystallization. So the molecular mass of nickel is 59, there is one nickel. And then there is one sulfur, so there is 1 times 32, which is the same as 32 times 1, so whichever order you really like to do it. But you have to add up the individual mass for the atoms, and you have 4 oxygen, 4 times 16. And then you have the dot. The dot refers to the separation between the compound formula unit, okay, which is ionic compound, and you have the water molecule that call crystallized, crystallized together with the ionic compound unit, and you have 7 water crystallization. So 7 times bracket, 2 times 1 plus 16 times 1. Okay, so the nickel surface is 59 times 1 plus 32 times 1 plus 16 times 4. I get 155. And I have 7 water crystallization, 7 times 18, that is 126. So the molecular mass for this nickel 2 sulfate heptahydrate with 7 H2O molecule is 2 and 1. Place my Pound. Now there's chromium 3. This is nickel. Yep. As shown here, it is nickel 2 sulfate with 7 H2O. It's given on the bottle 2 at 0 0.82. I got 2 at 1 because I'm using a very uh, basic periodic table, well, a very elementary, very primitive periodic table based on the 14 to 16 years old, all level or IGCSE curriculum. Okay? So that's it, really, that I want to show you on these uh, a few compounds. Uh, ranging from colored compounds of transition metals, remember transition metals, compounds of these uh, series of metals, transition metals or transition compounds are usually colored and there's a property of transition metals uh, as you have covered in the theory section of uh, your chemistry. And then there are also uh, the group 1 or the group 2 compounds, things like magnesium sulfate hydrated, and these are usually white, they are not colorless, these are white colored, just like the color of the bottle itself, these are white colored, solid, and there was the sodium carbonate, and this is zinc sulfate, so zinc is not really colored compounds because it's something you have learned in air level chemistry, so you will learn why zinc does not form uh, color compounds once you reach air level uh, chemistry, okay, just first the sodium carbonate that I had just now. Sodium, 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 sodium. So this was the sodium carbonate hydrated that I showed you earlier. It is also white in color, and there are many other transition metal compounds that are colored. Okay. So what's the reason for me working with these hydrated compounds? It's because there's a there's a test for water. The test is using cobalt chloride. So not surprisingly, this is cobalt two chloride. So this is a strip of paper. It is pink in color. Okay. It is pink in color and it say cobalt chloride. I get it from well this company. Okay. So a lot of times, all level and also A levels, you are not actually provided with this paper if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but if you happen to be provided with cobalt chloride paper, cobalt chloride paper is pink in color. Pink. Not sure if the color is very apparent, but it is pink. Let us show you against the white background. You can see the slight pink color. In the presence of water, so I am just going to take one strip and of course this is tap water, but then tap water is still water. So I'm going to add 
what to do to it. And it is not very good at all. What am I thinking? Um, um, what am I thinking? Um, 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 um. It's not meant to be pink, by the way. It's not meant to be pink, okay? So I stand corrected. It's not meant to be pink. These are not very good cobalt chloride paper anymore because the cobalt chloride hydrated, remember? Cobalt chloride. Cobalt chloride with the water, H2O. It was this color. So this is already a very old sample of the test paper. That's why you have, that's why you have this thing turning pink because the water vapor in the air already turned all the supposedly blue should have been blue okay what I'll do instead is I will I will show you by heating this letter I remove all the water of crystallization and then it will become blue because once I remove all the water I only have the thing there that will become blue and that is actually uh, what is used to to to, to test for water vapor that is it will become blue and they actually use it to coat the filter paper and when you have water in contact with the cobalt to chloride uh, blue colored thing and then it will turn pink again because it will form the uh, hydrated compound again anyway I'll show you that in a little bit let me start off with something simple So we have our, so this thing is not that useful anymore because they've all gone bad. Okay, so you don't want to focus on seeing my face. Let me actually stop that first. Let me start with the color, with the white color compound, which is sodium carbonate hydrated, zinc sulfate hydrated, and one more. Uh, what was the other one. Yeah, I those two other one. Magnesium sulfate hydrated. Okay. So I have test tubes. By right, I should be heating in a boiling tube. By right, I should be heating in a boiling tube because boiling tube can resist higher temperature. But I just want to show you what you will see when you have a white solid and sometimes you are asked to heat it. Okay, you're asked to make observations. Alright, so you don't even know what solid it is. I'm going to start out with this compound called magnesium sulfate heptahydrate. Does not matter because you're not supposed to know what the compound is. So what matters is you're given this white solid. They will give you in a vial. Okay, they give you in a small vial. So I put a little bit of this. They will say uh, have a spatula of it in a test tube. Heat it and then see what happens. Heat it and then see what happens. Right. So here I already know it's magnesium sulfate, but if you don't know what it is, then you can see exactly what happens. Okay? Before I turn on my Bunsen burner, make sure the gas hall is closed. Let me just check if there's a gas in here. Yep, there's a gas in here. So we need to make sure the gas hall is closed because we don't want to endanger ourselves. So none of these are flammable compounds, so I'm okay with the fire on it. So this is the yellow color flame. We don't want to heat with the yellow color flame. We want to heat it with the blue color flame. So this is the white solid. So you need to see exactly what happened when I heat it. Okay. So as I heat it, not too sure if you can see exactly what happens here. So I'll show, bring it close to the screen. You see the white solid there? You see, you see some colorless liquid. There is actually colorless liquid formed on the upper side of the tube because you are removing the water of crystallization and the water of crystallization escaped as water vapor because it's very hot. The escape as H2O gas, but then the upper part of the tube was cold. So when the hot H2O gas, the steam, move up to the upper part of the tube, they will condense because hot to cold, they will condense on the upper part of the tube. So your observation is you get colorless liquid. I started with a dry test tube just now. I get a colorless liquid forms on the upper part of the tube. 
when you hit a white solid, when you hit any solid, and you get a colorless liquid forming on the upper part of the tube, you should be thinking there is water of crystallization, okay? Because this colorless liquid is more slightly water, which of course you can test with a with an actually good cobalt chloride paper, which should be blue in color, and you will turn pink in the presence of water. Not that not that cobalt chloride paper which I had earlier. <laughs> there was there was an old one, okay? So it seems like the solid. This can also be a real practical experiment where how can you ensure all the water crystallization has been driven off? Well, you need to heat the bit with the water as well to get rid of all the water. So usually if you want to do a, a gravimetric, so gravimetric analysis. Gravimetric analysis is to do with those. Gravimetric analysis is to do with uh, mass calculations. So mass calculations means you need to be exact. So we don't do it in a test tube. We'll have a proper crucible where we heat until we have constant mass. And I will share that in another tutorial video sometime in the near future if I have the opportunity. But here, my point is you get a colorless liquid formed on the upper part of the tube because the steam that escaped from the water of crystallization escaped as H2O or gas, hot end to the cold end, the condensers, so you get colorless liquid forms on the upper part of the tube. That is one observation, all right? And of course, what happened to the solid? The white solid remains there, okay? Usually, they become very hard to remove because they dries out on the end of the test tube. Whatever you do, when you after you heat it very strongly on the Bunsen burner with the blue flame, do not wash with water straight away. Hot glass, water, they will break, okay? So leave it to cool. And because you are dealing with fire, make sure that you are very careful with fire. Make sure you use test tube holder that can hold the test tube uh, tightly so that you don't break the test tube and you're not going to touch the hot test tube, all right? So I used this one to scoop out the sodium thing just now. Uh, I'll show you another one. Now I use the zinc sulfate. It should produce the same result. Oh no, I used this one just now. So do not contaminate your chemicals, so make sure you clean up your spatula after you use it. So this is the zinc, this is the zinc sulfate, hydrated, it's also very crystalline. So what are we going to see here, it's probably similar, okay, so let's have a look. So my test tube is clean and dry, okay, clean and dry no water at all, no liquid, sorry. You can't tell it's water, but you suspect it's water because it's a colorless liquid that comes from heating a solid. So this one, you see the solid has started to like, it produces that sound just now, right? Because it was heating very strongly. And now I've got a colorless liquid. I've got condensation on the upper part of the tube. And it's a colorless liquid that forms on the upper part of the tube. If I heat it further, then the liquid will travel further up because, well, you know, the upper part of the tube is cold. And then the water vapor, the steam, the escape from the water of crystallization uh, will escape as water vapor or steam. When they get to the upper part of the tube, which is cool, they will condense. They will condense into a colorless liquid. Again, when you heat a solid, whether it's a white solid or whether it's a colored solid, as I'll show you in a little bit, you get a colorless liquid forming on the upper part of the tube. You should really be thinking about the compound is hydrated, the compound contains the water of crystallization. So enough on the white colored compound. Show you on a on a copper two sulfate hydrated. This is copper two sulfate with five H two O. So this is a blue color solid, as I shown you, very very crystalline, like that. I will just take a little bit out, well, a little bit out. Take it away. Really should have goggles and safety glasses and my lab coat. This is a blue color solid, as you can see, very crystalline. You can hear the sound. It doesn't stick on the walls of the thing because it's dry. 
when your test tube is dry, it should not have any solids stuck on the side at all. The upper part is dry, the lower part is dry. Okay. This was copper 2 sulfate with 5 water of crystallization, which of course you know how to uh, calculate the molecular mass already. That was one of the earlier exercises. Okay. In qualitative analysis, they like to ask you to uh, work out the identity of the cations and stuff. In air levels, they like to ask you the case study of copper 2 plus and cobalt 2 plus, among many other traditional metals. But here I'm just showing you the water crystallization uh, will come off first when you do thermal decomposition. If it does decompose, the water crystallization always comes off first, all right? So because water boils at 100 degrees Celsius. Bunsen burner, 100 degrees Celsius, very easy to reach when you have the blue color flame. So let's start heating. So just bring attention to this. You could see that the blue color solid has slowly turned white. So there's a bit of white solid now. And then there is a condensation. And this condensation is not colored. It's not blue in color. As you could see, it is a colorless liquid. These are liquid. These are not gas because they condenses on the upper part of the tube. I touch it outside and it doesn't do anything because the liquid is actually inside. Because your water vapor was inside, your steam was inside, it condenses on the upper part of the tube because the compound has water of crystallization. This is what you see. You see a colorless liquid form on the upper part of the tube. This is also what you see. The blue solid has turned white. I will heat it more strongly to get rid of all the water of crystallization and hopefully it should make more sense in a little bit. The fire is not that strong. So I'm heating it a bit strongly now. And as I heat it more strongly, then all the water of crystallization will be driven off. Here it's very easy because uh, you can see the color change. Whereas for the colored, whereas for the color, for the white colored solid, it's very difficult to tell, right? If, if you have um, gotten rid of all the water or not, okay? So here you can tell that they already turned whitish. And they're already kind of stuck on the side, so I do not want to heat it even more strongly because I'm heating using a test tube and I do not want to break my test tubes, okay? So that was the copper 2 sulfate hydrated. The blue solid has gone... The blue solid... Oh no, where am I? Where am I? Better take care of that first. So I've got a colorless liquid formed on the upper part of the tube. The blue solid has gone white. Okay, the blue solid has gone white. Not too sure how clear it is there. All right, let me show you the cobalt. Okay, so remember we're supposed to test for um, test for water, test for the presence of water using cobalt chloride, which is not supposed to be pink because pink means it's hydrated. It's supposed to be blue. Okay, so I'm gonna start out with this cobalt two chloride ClCO two dot six H two O. It's a pink color solid. I will heat it until all the water has been removed. Pink color solid. Let me see if I can get a white background. Pink color solid. The test tube is dry. If it is not dry, it will have stuck on the side. Okay? So dry upper part, dry lower part. Pink solid. This was cobalt. Well, this is cobalt to chloride. Hydrated. Okay? Let's see what happened when we heat it. So what do we see? The solid is no longer pink, it is blue. And what else do you see? You see colorless liquid. I don't know how clear it is. You see a colorless liquid form on the upper part of the tube because there's condensation inside and it is not colorless.
colored. The solid is colored, but the liquid is not colored. The compound has not melted. The compound is still a solid. And it's blue a little bit there because of the liquid water that is still present. I could continue to heat it and then I would, um, I would get rid of the last bit of water. So if I just continue heating it and I'll get rid of the last bit of water and everything should be blue. Okay? So I do get a colorless liquid. It's not a white liquid. This is a white sticker. But these are colorless liquid formed on the upper part of the tube. And there's a result of the water crystallization being driven off uh, by heat and uh, the water crystallization boils off as steam or water vapor. And now, this is what you call anhydrous. Anhydrous cobalt 2 chloride is blue in color. It's supposed to be the color of this thing called cobalt chloride pepper. This is anhydrous. This is anhydrous cobalt 2 chloride, which is what we use to test for water. Anhydrous cobalt 2 chloride is blue. This paper is supposed to be blue because it's supposed to contain anhydrous cobalt 2 chloride. When you add water to it, I don't want to add water straight away because this test tube is hot. You do not ever put water to a hot test tube. You do not ever wash a hot test tube straight away. You let it cool down a little bit. Later on, I'm going to come back and add water to it and we're going to see the color change because cobalt 2 chloride anhydrous, meaning without the water crystallization, is the test for water. Okay, So this paper is gone because I think it's been many years, so it's already all turned pink because of the presence of water vapor in the atmosphere. Okay, um, I'll just show you one more perhaps. Um, nickel 2 chloride. So nickel 2 chloride was this beautiful green color. Alright, so I'll scoop out a little bit of it. Let's use the green uh, spatula. So this, this tutorial is not about it's not about testing for the cations or the anions. It's about showing you the water crystallization uh, present, as well as how to what kind of observations to make when you're asked to heat a test uh, a solid. Right? This is a solid. The test tube is dry. It doesn't stick on the test tube at all. It is a green color solid. It's a light green solid. This was nickel nickel two chloride, and with six water nickel two should have been roman numeral nickel two chloride ni2 plus cl minus nicl2 with six h2o we did the exercise on calculated molecular weight just now nickel two plus is not the usual metal cations that you would test for in o level igcs or even o level uh, even a level chemistry but then of course when they give you a solid it does not matter right because they could simply ask you to just justify you know we see a colored solid tells you there's a transition metal uh, uh, present, transition metal ion. It's a solid, most likely it's an ionic solid, and therefore it could also have water crystallization. And that's what we're going to test here. Oops, sorry. So yellow color flame to begin with, Ooh, incomplete combustion. Then send it to the blue flame by opening the, by opening the gas holes. I'm going to heat the solid. And the nice green color has gone to a. Uh, oh, it's gone to a nice color actually. Have a look. It's gone to a yellow color. But first of all, do you see the upper part of the tube has got some colorless liquid around it? You've got condensation inside because there's colorless liquid. It's not a green liquid, it's a colorless liquid formed on the upper part of the tube. That is what you see a colorless liquid formed on the upper part of the tube. What happened to the solid? Because the solid was not white, it was green. Now it's a bit orange yellow. Not too sure if it is that clear or not, but it's gone a bit orangey yellow. And that's the beauty of transition metal uh, compounds because we're dealing with a lot of colors, right? So a lot of students get really excited when they work with transition metal compounds, okay? So uh, I just want to get rid of the water really, and I'll come back and, and add water to it and see what happened, okay? So this was my blue color cobalt just now. The upper part already gone pink a little bit because maybe because when I put it under gravity, the liquid water actually drops back down and it turns it into pink again. But majority of it is still blue. 
it's still pretty hot, so I don't want to add water to it just yet. Okay. Um, should I do one more? Mm, maybe I just do one more. Okay. So this was the chromium tree chloride just now, all right? And I had my test tubes. Oh, sorry, I had my I had my spatula just now that has a little bit of chromium tree chloride in there. It's gone a bit uh, liquidish because of the water crystallization. Anyway, I'll take out a little bit of it. So chromium tree chloride, as you can see, it's green in color. So the solid is supposed to be nice crystalline, but because of the humidity, uh, humidity is to do with uh, moisture in the air, as well as, uh, oh no, my, my testy holder is not very, very good now. It's, you see it's sticking to the side now, because um, it, it kind of like doesn't want to stay crystalline unlike the other hydrated salt very easily because of the hot and humid uh, weather here in Brunei, where I'm based. Uh, but it should show you the effect anyway. This is a hydrated salt. It is green in color. Transition metal compound. Chromium. Chromium is right here. Chromium, CR. Okay, it's green colored solid. Chromium 3 plus is a cation that you'll be asked to test for in the, in the O level or IGCSE or even A level exam. Uh, they like to ask you to compare. You should be able to differentiate between chromium 3 plus and also iron 2 plus when you react it with sodium hydroxide by adding the sodium hydroxide first in little bit, little amount, and then adding excess. All right. So I'm going to heat the green solid now, and because it was a hydrated salt, as we mentioned just now, so not too surprisingly, I get a colorless liquid forming on the upper part of the tube and that again is an indication of uh, the presence of uh, water of crystallization because even though the solid was green you get condensation on the upper part of the tube so that is not a green liquid you see a bit of moisture inside it is not outside colder end, hot end so when the steam or the water vapor escape from the water crystallization it goes to the upper part of the tube which is cool it condenses to give you the water back but you don't know it's water your observation is not a conclusion your observation is a colorless liquid formed on the upper part of the tube and then because we started with a colored compound which was green if i heat it a bit stronger the color is actually no longer green uh, this was chromium this again. This was chromium three chloride hexahydrate. Okay, so it looks like it's just the water on the upper part there. And then what happened to the to the solid itself? It's gone a bit purple-ish, a bit purple, a bit dark purple. Quite hard to see. Yeah. Anyway, so that's it really. Um, done enough tests on transition metal compound, which is colored and um, uh, they were hydrated. That's the focus of this tutorial video. I heated them and I get a colorless liquid form at the upper part of the tube. It's a result of the water being driven off by the heat of the Bunsen burner. And because the escape is steam or water vapor, boil off at 100 degrees Celsius at room temperature and pressure, right, H2O. So what happened when they reach to the colder part of the tube? You heat here, this is hot. The water vapor and steam reaches the upper part of the tube, which is cold then they will condense, they will condense on the inside and you will get a colorless liquid whether you started from the white solid or whether you started from the colored solid if you get a colorless liquid form on the upper part of the tube when you heat it, okay, with a Bunsen burner that means you have water crystallization of course the proper test of water would have been to use the anhydrous cobalt to chloride Anhydrous, as I talked about at the very beginning of this tutorial, anhydrous means no water crystallization. Hydrated means it has water of crystallization. This is a very old cobalt 2 chloride paper. It should have been blue. The anhydrous should have been blue, just like this cobalt 2 uh, chloride uh, hydrated salt that we heated up until we get rid of all the water. And then this is the color, the blue color, a bit. This is a very light shade of blue. That should have been the color of this uh, paper that we are going to test for. Uh, 
test for water. Okay, so we use anhydrous cobalt to chloride paper in order to test for water. So this was purple-ish. I'm just going to add distilled water to it. What color do you see? In the presence of water, the blue color will go pink. Okay. In the presence of water, the blue color will go pink. What I could do then is I could heat it and remove all the water and it will go back to blue. So this is the beginning of this idea of uh, reversible reactions. So a lot of uh, transition metal chemistry are actually reversible. And because they are colored, it's very easy to follow them by, by, by thinking about the color changes, indicating to you that there is a reaction happening one way, and there's a second reaction happening the other way as well. Therefore, this is a very good way of actually teaching students on the idea of reversibility. Obviously, not every reaction is reversible. For example, if this is your exam paper, and I burn it, I combust it with a Bunsen burner, I cannot get back the paper again. So some stuff are irreversible, but some reactions are, well, I, I meant to say some reactions are irreversible, but some reactions are reversible. Like your change of state, you put, you put liquid water into the freezer and you get ice. If you take the ice out on a hot, humid weather, like, like in Brunei, where I'm based, then the ice will melt into water. And of course, you can go back and forth. Just like this thing, we use the blue color, the blue color anhydrous cobalt to chloride, uh, on a strip of filter paper. This is actually wrong. This is, a, this is an expired cobalt to chloride. It's already totally pink. This should be the result if water is present. Just like I added water to the blue solid just now, which was anhydrous cobalt to chloride, it turned back to pink. Okay? So I could do the same thing. Remember this was the chromium. The chromium... Oops. The chromium 3 chloride, which was green, the hydrated. Remove the water crystallization, it's gone yellowy. It's gone yellow. So I add water to it. Um, or maybe it doesn't want to go back. It's not very soluble now. It's, I don't think this one wants to go back, you see? It doesn't want to go back at all. So there must be some underlying reactions that makes it not want to go back. Let me have a look at the other one. Oh no, sorry, that was not. The yellowy one was not the chromium. The yellowy one was the was the nickel 2, sorry. So it does look a bit greeny now, but probably the nickel 2 doesn't want to go back, not too sure. This is the chromium 3 chloride. This was the purple colored solid that I get after I add water to it. Does it go back to being green at all? No, nah, it doesn't really want to go back to being green at all. So, so sometimes after you heat them for too long, if the color doesn't go back, like the cobalt stuff here, it probably means that the compound decomposes because if it doesn't decompose, it should give me back what I started with when I add water. But if it decomposes under heat, remember we are heating it, so when it decomposes, it turns into something else, which means that, you know, when something is decomposed, it's gone. You know, when the body decomposes after, when an animal carcass, uh, the animal body after they die, after they pass away, then when it decomposes, you don't get the body back again. All right? There was a copper two. This was the copper two that give you the white color solid. All right, so copper two sulfate hydrated. This was the hydrated salt that I heated just now. Remember, we started with very blue colored solid, very blue colored crystals. That was hydrated. In the absence of the water crystallization, the upper part of the tube is just water. In the absence of water, because I heat it very strongly, you don't see any blue colored solid at all. They are all white colored, white colored solid. And because there's anhydrous, and I do actually have, I do actually have copper to sulfate anhydrous. Anhydrous means no water of crystallization. And let me look at the molecular mass. You see, the only level is CuSO4 because that is without the water crystallization. It's a bit blueish, probably because this has been around for a long time, so it's absorbed a little bit of water from the atmosphere. But if it was freshly heated like this to remove the water crystallization, it would have been white. Okay, and I'm just going to add water to this anhydrous copper to sulfate. What do you notice? Right, what do you notice? 
So they can ask they can ask you this in a qualitative analysis experiment, not just in all level, but most likely in air level, I guess. Uh, where they give you a blue color solid, they ask you to heat it, and then you see colorless liquid form on the upper part of the tube. The blue solid goes white. Okay, you heat strongly until it goes white. That's your observations. And then you add water to it after it cools down and you get a blue solution again. The fact that you get a blue solution again, okay, refers to this idea of reversible reactions. In the presence of water, the, the anhydrous copper to sulfate gets surrounded by water molecules again and they reform that um, uh, hydrated compound, okay, which you can which you can then purify by crystallization, or better hold it tightly. Purify by crystallization, and you can get the hydrated crystals where the water as the solvent can co-crystallize, meaning they crystallize together with the giant ionic structure of copper to sulfate. Actually, this was the nickel, nickel two compounds that went a bit yellow after I heated it strongly. Just now it didn't look like it was gonna dissolve, but now I think the green color solution it started to return. There was the nickel two, there was the very nice color of nickel two chloride, hexahydrate. As I mentioned, nickel two is not really a case study uh, in transition metal chemistry, especially not for all level uh, or IGCSE chemistry. Uh, it's not a case study in L level uh, chemistry, but then they can obviously ask you uh, some stuff which are beyond what they normally ask because it's within the scope of the first row transition metal. What else can we say? We started out with the white color solid of the magnesium, I think just now. Magnesium carbonate, sorry, magnesium sulfate hydrated. This one. We also talk about zinc sulfate hydrated. We also talk about sodium carbonate hydrated. So those are white solid. When you heat them up, you get a colorless liquid form on the upper part of the tube, you see the condensation, you don't see the liquid, you don't see the water, okay? Because we didn't exactly test for water, but we heated a white solid strongly, therefore we see a colorless liquid form on the upper part of the tube. It simply tells you there's water or crystallization present. And um, yeah, and then what can you say to the solid? The solid when that dries out, the solid gets stuck on the side at the bottom of the test tube. There is another observation that you can make. The solid remains white unlike that of the color compound, transition metal compound just now, the changes color when they become anhydrous. All right, so that's it in this tutorial video. Uh, I didn't exactly cover identification of cations or anions, but in terms of um, uh, heating them and seeing the reversibility, seeing the color changes, especially for the transition metal uh, compounds, which are colored to begin with, that simply tells you that uh, those reactions are reversible. And it's a, it's a huge topic in air level transition metals in terms of what the water and the other anions does in the, in the structure of the transition metal compound itself. All right, thank you for watching. Don't forget to click the button on the bottom right to subscribe to my channel. And um, please share the channel widely with all your friends, your chat group, your study groups, your juniors, your seniors in school, and uh, all the other people whom you think can benefit from whatever my channel has to offer. Thank you for watching and do follow me at ptet.chemistry. That is ptet.chemistry on Facebook, IG, as well as Twitter if you use this social media platform or when you return to this social media platform, presumably after uh, 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 the really big public exam. Okay, so see you in the next tutorial video and thank you for watching.